Hi, everyone. This is Chiu Shi from Arizona State University. Welcome to this big data tutorial series. Today, we are honored to, to welcome Professor Tang, who is from North Carolina State University. He will talk about a very interesting topic, deep learning for scenario generation and scenario reduction in short-term power system operations. We will, in this presentation, we will see how Professor Tang used scan network and uh, autoencoder to solve some problems with the deep penetration of renewable energies. And uh, this talk will be around 90 minutes. And uh, at the end of this talk, Professor Wong and I will organize the Q&A questions, uh, Q&A section. And uh, if you feel, uh, to have some problems, some questions, please feel free to ask me uh, through the chat box. And I will now give the speaker to Prof Professor Wang, who will give a brief introduction to Professor Tang. Please. Thank you, Chou Shi. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce yeah, Professor Tang, yeah, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering in NC State. And uh, he received a bachelor in Tsinghua University and master, yeah, in, uh, master and PhD in U University of Southern California. And then he was a postdoc, a yeah, joint postdoc in yeah, University of California at Berkeley and Stanford. And his research includes power system economics, electricity market, power system operation and control data analytics. Yeah, he's the editor of IEEE transactions on sustainable energy, and also an editor of IEEE power engineering letters. So one interesting stuff I want to yeah, mention is that yeah, he recently won the yeah, um, U U United States Department of Energy projects as a principal investigator. Yeah, the project name is Day Ahead Probabilistic Forecasting of Night Load and Demand Response Potentials with High Penetration or Behind the Meter Solar Plus storage. So yeah, today's talk will be quite interesting because it has some impact and related to yeah, deep learning. Thank you, Professor Tang. Please go ahead with your talk. Yeah, thank you, um, Chiu Shi and uh, Yang, so for the introduction. And uh, so this is Wen Yuan Tang from NC State University. Today, uh, I will introduce um, how to uh, uh, apply deep learning for scenario generation and the scenario reduction in the short-term power system operations. So this is the uh, agenda of my talk. First, I, I will give you an introduction. So what motivates this problem? And then I, since this is a tutorial series, so I will give a, a, a brief overview of the popular deep learning models. Then I will proceed with these two problems, scenario generation and the scenario reduction separately. For each problem, I will first introduce the methodology and the deep learning architecture we use. And then uh, we will conduct numerical experiments to demonstrate the superior performance of the proposed deep learning methods. So finally, so, uh, I will conclude this talk. So, First, uh, how to make uh, do decision making under uncertainty? So, um, in the literature, usually we follow a stochastic programming approach, and uh, such a stochastic programming problem is typically uh, often formulated as a two stage problem. So, in the first stage, uh, we have the first stage decisions X. So they are called here and now decisions. In the second stage, some random outcome omega will be realized. And then in the second stage, we need to make second stage decisions, which are the decision vector y. And uh, this second stage decisions are called wait and see decisions, also known as the recourse actions. Note that this y uh, would depend on both the, your first stage decision x and the realization of the random outcome omega. And uh, uh, for illustration, usually we consider linear problem, stochastic pro program problem, but it's not necessarily the case. And uh, here, so the Q 
uh, which depends on both your first stage decisions X and uh, the random outcome omega uh, as the optimal value of the second stage of problem. It's also called the recourse function. And then the expected of Q is called the expected recourse function. Here, Y is a um, decision variable. So we do not explicitly ex express Y as a function of omega because uh, Y needs to solve this problem, which depends on omega. But when we write these two level problems in a single uh, equivalent form, aggregated form. So we need to explicitly express Y as a function of omega. So in this aggregated form, we still have a single uh, decision vector for the first stage, which is X. But for the second stage, so depending on the realization of omega for every omega, so we need to determine the second stage decision Y of omega. Of course, uh, each Y of omega also depends on your choice of X. So you need to optimize X and Y uh, jointly in this uh, two-stage stochastic programming problems. And uh, when the sample space is finite, which means there's only a, 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 a limited number of um, out, possible outcomes, and then we can just characterize the probability of the based on the sample space by the these discrete values. So assume for each outcome omega, so the probability of that is pi of omega, then we can express the expectation in a more explicit form. So then this becomes uh, just a large scale deterministic form of the original two stage stochastic form, stochastic programming problem. And of course, in the literature, uh, especially in the operations research uh, community, so people, researchers have developed um, uh, various methods to solve the, uh, for example, from the linear stochastic programming problem to the mixed integer linear stochastic program, and then for the more general convex stochastic programming problem, or even non-convex ones, or even multi-stage ones. But this is not the focus of this talk. Okay. Now, how, how are short term power system operations related to the uh, two stage stochastic programming problem? So, we, uh, as we, uh, we all know, so nowadays, uh, more and more countries and the regions have set an ambitious goal of achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So some countries may even set a more ambitious goal. And that means um, our penetration of renewable generation uh, will continue uh, to be increasing. What is the nature of renewable generation? So for renewable generation, such as wind and solar, and uh, they have uh, an intermittent and a non-dispatchable nature. So not all the renewable generation um, has is, is now dispatchable. For example, for the hydro plant, so it is dis dispatchable. But for the increasing uh, wind and the solar generation, so they are now dispatchable. So there are challenges in integrating such renewable energy into the grid. And uh, due to the stochastic nature, so it calls for new operating paradigms for our short-term power system operations, including unit commitment and the economic dispatch. Uh, that is from a deterministic approach to a stochastic programming approach. Uh, note that uh, at the high level, at the transmission level, so in most wholesale electricity markets, at least in the US, uh, we still follow a deterministic approach to do the unit commitment and its, uh, economic dispatch because there are too many entities and too many decision variables. and. Uh, it's very difficult to solve a stochastic programming problem based on that. Moreover, it's very hard to solicit the information about the, uh, to solicit such probabilistic information from the market participants. So that's why uh, in the wholesale markets, so the clearing, the dispatch, uh, still follow a deterministic approach. So based on the bids, 
which means the generation bids and the uh, supply offers and also other financial bids like virtual bids. So, but, the, uh, but since a stochastic programming approach may give you more efficient outcomes, so it is preferred, for example, and it will be suitable for a small scale grid like a microgrid and uh, where we have centralized control, the system operator has uh, has centralized control, then it might be, and it has all the uh, probabilistic information about the renewable generation on site. In that case, it is more appropriate to apply the stochastic programming approach. So here is an example of a stochastic data head scheduling problem. And uh, so there are two stages. Uh, one, the first stage is the day ahead, the day before the operating day. And then the second stage is the operating day where all the randomness um, is realized. So typically uh, we can consider the objective function uh, as minimizing the total cost, which is the commitment cost, commitment cost plus the expected dispatch cost. For the commitment cost, usually it needs to be made day ahead so that is our first stage decision. And then once the randomness is realized and uh, we can do the dispatch, so we, uh, we will have dispatch cost, which depends on our first stage decision and also the realization of the randomness. So such a problem is subject to uh, some system and uh, unit constraints. For example, the power balance constraints the transmission constraints and the generating unit constraints. For the commitment cost, it can be the startup cost, no load cost, uh, which does not depend on the output level, but, also, but only depend on so whether you want to turn the generators on or off. For the dispatch cost, uh, it can be the fuel cost, uh, the generation cost, and uh, it can also include the load shedding penalty, et cetera. For the generating unit constraints, so there are constraints about each generating unit. So they can be a generation capacity constraints, ramping constraints, minimum uptime and the downtime constraints, et cetera. So of course, there are many ways to model, formulate such a stochastic data head scheduling problem because uh, some generators may not be flexible enough. They also, uh, in, in that case, you may include some dispatch costs even in the data head stage, right? And, uh, but just a, this is just a stylized characterization of uh, this kind of problems. So it fits the framework of two-stage stochastic programming problem. And uh, so what is the randomness in such a stochastic data head scheduling problem? And uh, the random outcome omega can be, for example, the wind power generation. So in this microgrid. Alternatively, we can consider the forecast. Air. Suppose we have uh, an existing uh, point forecasting method for this. Then we can consider the forecast error as the random outcome. So at the very high level, they are equivalent, right? Um, but uh, but the detailed probabilistic uh, distribution can be different but we can consider either of them. Sometimes it is preferred to consider the forecast error rather than the wind power, the forecast error of wind power generation than the wind power generation itself. Why? Because uh, for forecast error, it is more homogeneous. It is less heterogeneous than, than the wind power generation itself, right? And uh, we, usually if, as a system operator, we do have some four point forecasts. So, uh, it might be more accurate, more effective to consider the forecast area as the random outcome, but we will consider both. So in our numerical experiments. And uh, note that mathematically, so the omega uh, is a random outcome that comes from a uh, sample space. It has an abstract space. And, uh, but we need to do numerical study, numerical analysis, that's why it is often convenient to uh, map this random outcome omega to a real valued vector indexed by time. So the resulting real val valued vector is called a stochastic process. So in our case, it is essentially a stochastic, a, a random vector. 
uh, with 24 dimensions. And though we, we will consider the hourly wind power generation or the hourly forecast errors of wind power generation in this work. So it is all, we, we fix it as a 24 dimensional uh, random vector. And uh, so, however, it is hard to characterize or find the, motive, the underlying multivariate probability distribution of uh, this stochastic process, right? And uh, even if the true distribution is known, the resulting stochastic programming problem may not be computationally tractable. Because, uh, so first, because the underlying distribution can be very complicated. Secondly, so our stochastic programming problem can be complicated itself by itself. For example, it may contain some binary variables, integer variables. And uh, it is true when we have unit commitment decisions. So therefore, we need some discretization anyway, okay, to solve the problem. And uh, this motivates the concepts of concept of scenarios. So which is a well-established concept in, uh, in the literature. Uh, we want to approximate a stochastic process by scenarios. Each scenario is a single realization of the stochastic process. So therefore, this is a, real, a realization. So for a particular realized omega, and uh, again, it is also a 24 dimensional vector. And uh, we typically assume equally likely scenarios, which means if we have 100 such scenarios, then the probability of each scenario is um, one over 100, okay? So this is an example of generated scenarios of wind power generation. So uh, for example, uh, when, we, when they generated the scenario, so it is uh, on this day, uh, it's zero, okay, at the beginning of this day. And then they have lead time, which means, so we generate these uh, scenarios at, at zero, H zero. And then we look into the future for one hour, for two hours until 43 hours. Okay, then as you can imagine, so for, for small lead time, for short lead time, so the variance is small, but for longer lead time, so the variance can be larger and larger. And uh, from this, you can also view scenarios as a type of forecasts, right? You may be very familiar with point forecast, so which is denoted by the solid line. Okay, that is, we just make a single uh, forecast for every time step. But for scenario, so we give uh, a number of uh, time trajectories. Okay, so this gives you more information. So in the in a probabilistic sense, and uh, uh, it may be more useful than the point forecast because you can utilize the set of these 12 scenarios to make decision making and the uncertainty, okay. And uh, also uh, they give you the plots, the observations. Observations means the actual realization, okay. Af after the, the 43 hours, then we, we can plot the entire realized trajectory and you can compare. By the way, what is the relationship between the scenarios or the scenario set, which is composed of 12 scenarios and the point forecast? So they can be very related. For example, you can first generate the 12 scenarios and then you take the average of them as your point forecast, which is the average, which is a single trajectory. Alternatively, you can use a different methodology to generate your point forecasts. For this figure, I, I think so the point forecast is generated by an, a separate methodology. Why? Because for example, you can check this point. Apparently this solid point is not the average of the, these um, gray lines. So, so I guess, so for this figure, the point forecast is not simply the, the average of the 12 scenarios, okay. 
but scenarios do give you more information and uh, you, 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 can, you can build the four point forecast based on the scenarios by simply taking the average, okay. So as I mentioned, scenarios can be viewed as a type of forecast and, uh, and uh, it can be viewed as a, a discrete version, uh, approximate, approximate discrete version of the underlying distribution. So therefore, when we solve the stochastic programming problem, uh, a typical uh, general approach is called sample average approximation SAA, uh, which means instead of considering the exact underlying distribution of the randomness, so we just consider a number of scenarios and uh, we take the average of them by assuming each scenario occurs with equal probability. Then we convert this complicated expectation so into a simple submission. And uh, this, so it's not hard, hard, it's not hard to imagine that due to the law of large numbers, such an a sample average approximation method has some desirable asymptotic properties. But the key is to yield high quality decisions. So we need to build a high quality scenario set. If the scenario set we use is not so representative, which means it does not approximate the underlying prob probabilistic dist probability distribution, then so the resulting decisions may far from far away from the optimal decisions. Okay, here when we say decisions, uh, we focus on the first stage decisions. Why? Because for the second stage decisions, we've already seen the realizations, and typically it's very easy to optimize the first stage problem. So it is trivial usually to optimize the second stage problem, but it is very difficult to optimize the first stage problem because uh, we can only choose a particular decision vector for first stage, but we have many different realizations. So we need to take all the realizations into account, okay, to make our first stage decision. So the decision making for the first stage is non-trivial. And therefore, so when we talk about high quality decisions, usually we refer We've, we emphasize on the first stage decisions. So to do that, we need to build a high quality scenario set. So this is a definition of our scenario generation problem. That is given historical time series data, we want to generate a number of representative sample paths into the future. In our case, so into the future means into the next 24 hours, okay given some historical data, so up to this point, up to the today. So we want to generate a number of representative 24 dimensional vectors. So into the next 24 hours, uh, in, into the next day, yeah. So what the traditional approach to scenario generation is first uh, to use historical data to fit a statistical model. Uh, such as ARIMA, which is a typical time series statistical model, so which stands for autoregressive uh, auto uh, in, uh, integrated, integrated moving average. And then we generate random samples from this statistical model. For example, we can use Monte Carlo sampling. So as long as this the, this statistical model we choose is accurate or approximately accurate, then by uh, random sampling this model, so we can get a very representative scenario set, right? And uh, the, such an SAA method will have very desirable uh, properties. The resulting uh, optimal value or optimal decisions are very close to the underlying true uh, exact optimal decisions. Okay. However, here's the problem. Uh, for tractability, we usually use some common statistical models, right? Such tractable common statistical models with simplified assumptions may not well capture the underlying temporal dynamics. 
Okay, how do you know the time series so follows such an Arima model? Usually it's not, especially for wind. So uh, it depends on too many factors, uh, which is very difficult to characterize by a simple uh, textbook statistical model, right? Some time series model. So this is a the problem. Therefore, and uh, this approach is often referred as a parametric approach. Therefore, in the literature, many non-parametric methods have been proposed, including radial basis function network, fuzzy prediction interval, regular one on copula, sparse Bayesian learning, kernel density estimation, and the infinite Markov switching autoregressive. However, so those methods are still supervised models, which require extensive Domain, domain knowledge for feature selection or feature engineering, which means you need to know uh, what variables, what features are important so to make your algorithm work. Okay, for example, the temperature, the humidity, and so on. So you, you need to have some domain knowledge. And uh, they are very difficult to tune and uh, implement. And uh, even if you get a very good model for a particular wind farm, it may not be applicable for another farm, okay, with different characteristics. And also most of the aforementioned methods utilize information at multiple sites to improve the accuracy. So they may, such methods may not be applicable when we have only a single site, when we only have a single time series in consideration. Therefore, some unsupervised models are preferred like the very popular uh, generative adversarial network, GAN, so in deep learning. And uh, there are also many variants of GANs, including the sequence generative uh, adversarial network, SeqGAN. In this work, we will adapt the SeqGAN for scenario generation of hourly wind power generation, or the forecast error of that on the next day. So this is the uh, introduction of the scenario generation problem. So a related problem is called scenario reduction. What's the motivation? So good discrete appro approximations often require the generation of a large number of scenarios, which may render the underlying optimization problem intractable, especially in the presence of integer variables. We do have such integer variables because we have unit commitment decisions. So in our uh, short-term um, power system operation problem. To regain, regain uh, tractability, we need to trim down the number of scenarios while uh, not uh, deteriorating the accuracy too much. Okay, this is a problem called scenario reduction. Given a large scenario set, we want to generate a small reduced scenario set that is representative of the original scenario set, original large scenario set. So scenario reduction can be viewed as a time series clustering task. And like common clustering algorithms, the generated scenarios, which, which means the new scenarios in the reduced set do not necessarily belong to the original scenario set. As long as they look similar to the original scenarios, they are representative of the original scenarios, then it's okay. You don't need to require, we just choose a subset of the original scenario set from the original scenario set as the reduced scenario set. So the new scenario, scenario set in the small reduced set, the new scenarios can be um, different than the original scenarios, that's fine. The traditional approach to the scenario reduction problem is first, to define a measure such as the Euclidean distance to quantify the similarity or the distance between two scenario sets. And then to solve an optimization problem, which is generally non-convex to maximize the measure. So what's the problem with this traditional approach? Um, uh, um, so based on that, we have some measure-based methods uh, like the Fortet Moria uh, probability matrix, space and moment distance, radial basis kernel function, nested dis distance, probability matrix and uh, correlations. 
However, those measure-based methods depend on a predefined measure, which may an, an deteriorate the generalization capability. And uh, it is very, very difficult to describe all the patterns in the large scenario sets, since the number of scenarios is reduced dramatically. And uh, some time series clustering methods are preferred, like the smooth formulation of DTW, dynamic time warping, and uh, the uh, usage of a mixture of autoencoders, uh, which we will introduce later. So in this work, for the scenario reduction problem, we will integrate a mixture of autoencoders with fuzzy clustering for scenario reduction of forecast areas of hourly wind power generation on the next day. Okay, so before we introduce our approaches to these two problems, scenario generation and the scenario reduction, so I, I would like to give an overview of the deep learning models for this tutorial series. So what is deep learning? Deep learning is a specific subfield of machine learning. So a new take on learning representations from data that puts an emphasis on learning successive layers of increasingly meaningful representations. The deep in deep learning isn't a reference to any kind of deep, deeper understanding achieved by the approach. Rather, it stands for the idea of successive layers of representations. Modern deep learning often involves tens or even hundreds of successive layers of representations, and they are all learned automatically from exposure to training data. Meanwhile, other approaches to machine learning tend to focus on learning only one or two layers of representations of the data. Hence, they are sometimes called shallow learning. In deep learning, these layered representations are almost always learned by models called neural networks, structured in literal layers stacked on top of each other. So the primary reason deep learning took off so quickly is that it offered better performance on many problems but that's not the only reason. Deep learning also makes problem solving much easier because it completely automates what used to be the most crucial step in machine learning workflow, feature engineering. So what makes deep learning different? There are um, two essential characteristics of how deep learning learns from data. The incremental layer by layer way in which increasingly complex representations are developed. And the fact that these intermediate incremental representations are learned jointly. So each layer being updated to follow both the representational needs from the layer above and the needs from the layer below. Together, these two properties have made deep learning vastly more successful than previous approaches to machine learning. So deep learning has several properties that justify its status as an AI revolution. So first, simplicity without the need for feature engineering. Second, the scalability. Deep learning is highly amenable to parallelization on GPUs. And then the versatility and the reusability. Unlike many prior machine learning approaches, deep learning models can be trained on additional data without restarting from scratch, making them viable for continuous online learning. Okay, so, and uh, uh, the very first, basic uh, model in deep learning is the fully connected neural network um, called FNN. That is every neuron or, or, or unit in each layer is connected to every neuron in the ne next layer. So the fully connected neural network is also called densely connected neural network. And uh, there's a class of theorems called universal approximation theorems imply that neural networks can represent a wide variety of interesting functions when giving appropriate weights. And uh, actually, so loosely speaking, so this can usually can also be achieved by some simple neural network with one or two layers. But why do we need deep learning? Because by deep learning, so the network may be uh, easier to train, okay? But for a simple neural network, you may need to have some domain knowledge, uh, knowledge which means you need to apply some feature learning. So to, to get uh, the exact form of the optimal network, 
but for deep learning, so and uh, it uh, relies less. So, for example, on the input and on the top topology of the network. Although theoretically, so in many cases, simple neural network can approximate um, an arbitrary form of function. But deep learning, by building a deep learning deep neural network, so uh, you can easily uh, train train it so to approximate the underlying truthful mapping between input and output. Um, so, but why do we need other topologies? <laughs> because uh, the aforementioned fully connected neural networks do not take into account the spatial structure of inputs, such as images. Therefore, uh, here we have a new topology called convolutional neural network, CNN, especially for the computer vision applications. So the fundamental difference between a densely connected layer and a convolutional, convolutional layer is that dense layers learn global patterns in their input feature space, whereas convolutional layers learn local patterns. So the key characteristic gives uh, CNNs two interesting properties. First, the patterns they learn are translation invariant. After learning a certain pattern in the lower right corner of a picture, a CNN can recognize it anywhere, for example, in the upper left corner. But a densely connected network or a fully connected network would have to learn the pattern um, anew as if it appeared at a new, uh, when it appeared at a new location. So this makes CNN very data efficient when processing images. Secondly, so CNNs can learn spatial hierarchies of patterns. A first convolution layer uh, will learn small local patterns such as edges, and then a second convolution layer will learn larger patterns made of features of the first layers, and so on. So this allows CNNs to efficiently learn increasing complex and abstract visual concepts. Okay, so here are some uh, uh, and terms in CNNs, for example, the filters that is in the depth axis, they will encode specific aspects of the input data. And then after every convolution layer, so we have uh, usually have a max pooling operation which can downsample and the feature maps. So finally, we still need to connect concatenate it with a fully connected layer to learn the global patterns. And for this specific classification problem, so there can be 10 uh, neurons or units in the output layer, uh, specifying the probability that this belongs to the zero, this belongs to one, until this belongs to digit nine, okay. And uh, so a major characteristic of all the neural network uh, you've seen so far, so is that they do not have memory. So each input uh, shown to them as processed independently with no state kept in between inputs. So with such networks like the FNNs and the CNNs, so in order to process a sequence or a time series of data points, you have to show the entire sequence to the network at once. That is turn it into a single data point. So such networks are called feed forward networks. In contrast, biological intelligence processes information incrementally while maintaining an internal model of what it's processing, built from past information and are constantly updated as new information comes in. So a recurrent neural network, RNN, adopts the same principle. So in a very simplified version, it processes sequences by iterating through the sequence elements and maintaining a state containing information relative to what it has been so far, what ha it has seen so far. So in effect, an RNN is a type of neural network that has an internal loop. Okay, so in theory, the simple RNN is able to retain information about inputs seen many time steps before. But in practice, such long-term dependencies are impossible to learn due to the vanishing gradient problem in, in machine learning uh, algorithms. Therefore, uh, a specific 
type of RNS called LSTM, long short term memory, has been proposed. Uh, LSTM scan networks can explicitly uh, remember information for long periods of time. So instead of a single network layer in simple RN, so in LSTM unit, each unit has four interacting neural network layers. So in the repeating module. And uh, so for example, for the first one, it is called, uh, it is part of the forget gate. So which tells which, what information to throw away from the cell state. And then the second and the third layers, they constitute the input gate, uh, what new information to store in the cell state. And then finally the output gate, which is the last layer. So tell us what information to output and uh, going to be the next hidden gate. So in LSTM, so the output vector is the same as the hidden vector, okay. Um, then, so there's also a popular deep learning model called GAN, Generative Adversarial Network. It is a generative model in which a generator network competes against an adversary, the discriminator network. So for example, in this case, the generator directly produces samples based on some random noise. Okay, and the discriminator attempts to distinguish between samples drawn from the training data and samples drawn from the generator. And uh, each of them will be trained iteratively so that generator's objective is to, is to fool the discriminator. So to make the fake image look real. And uh, the goal of the discriminator wants to distinguish between the real images and the fake images. And the learning in such a GAN network can be formulated as a zero sum game. And at the convergence, so the generator samples are indistinguishable from the real data. Then we get a very good generative model, right? We can generate uh, images that, that look, uh, look real, so based on some random noise. So finally, a, 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 a very popular deep learning model is called autoencoder. It is a neural network that is trained to attempt to copy its input to its output. So there's a hidden layer H uh, which describes the code uh, called the latent representation used to represent the input. And the, the first part is the encoder, which maps the input into the code. And the second part is called the decoder, which maps the code to a restriction of the input. So if we have the x prime equal to x, then this network is not useful, right? And uh, this is not our objective. Autoencoders are not are restricted to copy only approximately. Why? Because we are interested in the code, the h, which is an abstraction of the original data. So we are interested in this h. So taking on useful properties, we are not. We do not care too much about the restricted. Uh, x prime, which is equal to x or not, or just uh, approximately equal to x. We care more about the h. If this is trained well, so h will give a very good representation, simplified representation uh, of the original input. So after giving the overview of such these deep learning models, uh, we are ready to proceed with our methodologies for scenario generation and the scenario reduction problems. So again, uh, actually, so since we want to generate scenarios, right? Uh, it's natural to consider a generative model like GAN, but there are issues when applying GAN to generating sequences. First, GAN is designed for generating real valued continuous data but has difficulties in directly generating sequences uh, of discrete tokens, such as text. So this issue is minor because we, we focus on wind power generation or the forecast area of that, it is continuous. So, but still discretization may still be preferred for convenience. So if we can take care of discrete tokens, so which means, this means we can do discretization. So this, this may simplify our, um, calculation, okay. But the second issue is much more critical. That is, 
GAN can only give the score for an entire sequence. For a partially generated sequence, it is non-trivial to balance its current score and its future score. We will generate a sequence of 24 elements, right? So if we only we have one element that is abnormal, so that is not very unreasonable, then we can we may still get a very good score for the entire sequence because the other 23 elements may look real, right? But uh, this is not preferred, uh, especially for our power system operation. If we have a very unreasonable um, value for the wind generation or the forecast area of that, that means uh, we may have, uh, for example, a, a large uh, shortage of the load. Then we may turn a new generator on, right? And due to the minimum um, uh, uptime, right? And uh, it may be turned on for many hours, but this new generator may be very costly. So overall it's not cost efficient. So to turn it on, but this is just due to a single abnormal value in our generated scenario. So therefore, and we need to avoid this issue. So we want to make, uh, every partial gen partially generated sequence look real too. Okay, not just the entire sequence with 24 elements. So even if we just generated 10 elements, we want to make, make sure that they look real and that the next 11th element should also look real. So this is the issue with GAN. So that is, again, some values may be abnormal while the overall sequence has a good score which may lead to unreasonable unit commitment decisions, as I just described. Therefore, in the literature, um, a variant of GAN called sequence GAN has been proposed. So in sequence GAN, it considers the sequence generation procedure as a sequential decision-making process solved by re reinforcement learning. The state is the generated token so far and the action is the next token to be generated. And uh, in this model, it regards the generative model as a stochastic parameterized policy. And it employs a Monte Carlo method to approximate the state action value for evaluating policy gradient. So let's, uh, we will adapt this uh, sequence scan model and uh, uh, have some our own innovations. So, but let's explain this in our context. Okay. Explain the sequence scan, our adapted sequence scan model in our context. So uh, it looks like again, right? We have a generator network and a discriminator network. And the discriminator task is simple. Just compare our generated sequences and the real sequences from the training set. And uh, the, the task of the discriminator is to distinguish between these two different sequences. And uh, the novelty is in the generator part. So here, the input of the generator. So in GAN or uh, sequence scan, in the original sequence scan model, so the input is some random noise because um, and uh, indeed, so we, we want to generate uh, some, for example, some images that look real, right? And uh, 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 based on some uh, random noise, sometimes um, they, they will also use some uh, real images and then do some transformation to generate some uh, fake images. But it is more common to use some random noise. But here, for our problem, so we have a, a specific problem that is uh, to generate the uh, different scenarios for the next day, right? We have, we do have the information for the generation, for the wind power generation in the previous day. And we can utilize, utilize this instead of using some random noise, instead of using some random 24 dimensional uh, noise, right? So we can use the wind generation in the previous day. And uh, by experimenting, experiments so uh, we do see so and this makes our uh, generated 
uh, scenario set for the next day uh, looks better. Okay. Then what is the output of the generator? So this is uh, our task is uh, a scenario generation problem, which means we, we do not only generate one scenario. We want to generate many scenarios, like 100 scenarios or even um, 1,000 scenarios, right? But for but the wind generation in the previous day, it's just a single sequence. How can we get many different sequences for the next day? For example, 100 sequences for the next day based on a single sequence and today. So here's the trick. And uh, so we, uh, we will discretize and uh, uh, range of the wind generation. So for example, the wind, the capacity is 4,000 megawatts and then we use uh, one megawatt for each beam. Then we have 4,000 beams and uh, which corresponds to 4,000 units in the output layer. Then the soft max uh, will be used as the activation function. So therefore we can obtain the discrete uh, distribution of wind power generation or the forecast area of that. Then once we get that, those discrete distributions and um, probabilities, then we can sample that for as many scenarios as you want, okay? So this is the in input and output of the generator. Um, the actual novelty of scan, sequence scan lies inside this, okay, between input and output. So let me explain this in more details. The generator's objective is to maximize the reward to go from the beginning. Okay, what is the state? The state is the sequence that has been generated so far. The action in time step T, which is in our T, is the, uh, the value you want to generate. Okay, therefore, uh, this is the entire reward for the generator. And uh, note that this generator model is parameterized by theta. And uh, uh, we refer to it as a policy. So we will, uh, uh, which, which are essentially the parameters or the weights of in the network. We want to optimize this long vector theta so that the reward from the beginning to go from the beginning is maximized. Okay, and here this Q is the uh, state action value function. Given a particular state and given the action for this state, and this is the expected reward um, from this time to the end, okay. But of course, in this problem, so since for the discriminator, it will only gives you the entire score uh, for a complete sequence. So therefore, there is no immediate reward. There is only a final reward. Okay, but this is also an issue we need to take care of. The discriminator will give you an, a final reward for the complete sequence, which has 24 elements. But uh, for example, at the beginning, you want to generate the first element. So how can you score the first element? Next step, when you have first element and the second element that are generated, how do you score this partially generated sequence? Okay the D will only score the entire sequence. And this is the essential idea of sequence scan, which I will explain in the next slide. Next two slides, okay. Before I introduce that, but uh, so uh, it turns out that um, this problem, so we, we will opt optimize the grid and the policy, right? Choose the optimal theta. Then this model is trained via the um, grid, uh, the policy gradient. So the generator will be trained of, um, by the policy gradient. We will consider the gradient of the policy. That is the gradient of this reward to go function uh, with respect to the theta, the parameter of the generator model. It turns out that it is this. And still, so we need to explain, for example, how this Q function is calculated, right? Otherwise, we, we are not able to utilize this grid policy gradient. But at the high level, so once we know how to calculate Q, 
then we can calculate the entire gradient for this policy theta, which is the parameter of the uh, generative model. Then we can uh, train this in an iterative manner so that ultimately, so the generator will generate some sequences that look real. Okay. By the way, for the discriminator, it, its objective is to minimize the cross entropy loss. So this is um, just uh, the standard uh, objective of the discriminator, which is easy to understand. That is, if y is from the actual data, then we want to maximize this. And uh, if y is from the fake data, we want to minimize this. But it is my understanding that the curtailment risk. Hello, is there a question? No, only some noises. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, and uh, the discriminator only provides a reward value. So that is the probability of being real for a finished sequence Y, right? And uh, therefore, uh, we need to evaluate the state action value function. So for each time step, that is, we, uh, even if we only generate a, a partially generated sequence, so how can we evaluate that? So we do want to evaluate a partially generated sequence because we want every partially, every part of the sequence look real, not the entire sequence look real, right? So it is, as I mentioned before, uh, it is possible that the entire sequence looks real, but if there's a, a very unreasonable or abnormal value in the sequence, that will affect our unit commitment decisions. So which will greatly impact our, the efficiency or the optimality of our uh, decisions. So therefore it is important not only if score the entire sequence, but also score the partially generated sequence. So here's the idea in sequence scan model. That is, suppose uh, we have already generated the elements from one to T, T can be 10. Then how to generate the next 14 elements? So we do a Monte Carlo uh, search. So using our generative model, we just generate many sequence, many uh, and scenarios for the remaining 14 elements. And then we take, take the average and then Based on this new, uh, the entire sequence, right? Then we can use the discriminator to give you the entire score for that. Although at this time, so our task is just to generate the 11th, 11th element, but we use Monte Carlo to generate all the uh, next, all the remaining 14 elements and uh, we compare, but we will choose our generative model. We will choose the optimal current element so uh, ultimately okay but we we just uh, use Monte Carlo to generate uh, as many gen scenarios sin remaining sequences as we can so for the discriminator to score it so this is the idea of the sequence generative um, adversarial network we use and uh, then we can uh, uh, illustrate the performance of the method, so by some numerical experiments. So first, uh, we have two other benchmark algorithms, uh, some simple Gaussian fitting and uh, some multivariate kernel density estimation. We will compare those two benchmark algorithms with the se uh, sequence scan algorithm. So for illustration, we only generate 20 scenarios, but uh, all these models can generate as many scenarios as we want. And uh, so we have plotted the 20 gen generated scenarios in blue. And then the, the brown one is, is the average sample pass, the average of the 20 scenarios. And the, the red one is the, the actual realization or actual observation with the, which is from the actual data. Okay. So we can see, so first, the least safe margin, which is defined as this, okay. The, 
the minimum curve and the the difference between the minimum one and the actual realized one. So and the least the, the minimum difference between them for our sequential uh, sequence scan model is this, which is 159 megawatts. But this least safe margin for other two models are smaller, which means the generated scenarios in sequence scan model so we'll give you, we'll lead to more robust decisions because uh, it will, for some scenarios, so it will underestimate the wind power generation so that uh, you will have more robust unit commitment and dispatch decisions. And also we can check the, for example, the uh, ramping between the uh, our 21 to our 23. So the red one is the actual uh, ramp up amount, which is 200 megawatts. And we can see, so the sequence scan model can follow the fast ramping events better. So, and this is not just for, for this particular day, and we have tested many other days, and we do see the sequence scan, the scenarios generated by the sequence scan model uh, as very representative and, and can capture the temporal dynamics, temporal correlations in the wind power generation or the forecast areas of wind power generations better. Okay. So for some data set, we also, the first data set is the BPA. So Bonneville Power Administration data set, which gives you both the actual realization, actual observed uh, wind power and the fork they had forecast of and power, wind power. For Unreal data, so for the Unreal data we use, so we only have the uh, wind power data. So, but our model can also be adapted for the wind power generation instead of the forecast area of that. So now let's see the generated scenarios of wind power generation. Uh, we compare the proposed se uh, sequence scan model with the vanilla LSTM model and the KDE model. By vanilla LSTM, which it means we just use LSTM, but not the, uh, the GAN network and the uh, reinforcement learning in the sequential GAN network. So we can see it. the uh, sequence GAN model, the proposed model generates more diverse scenarios for example, then the LSTM network. So this leads to more robust decisions. Here for LSTM, it overestimates the wind power generation, right? That means, so in realization, in real time, so we need to call some uh, more flexible power plants, or we, we, we may have to do some load shedding, which is not desirable. On the other hand, so the sequence scan, sequence scan model captures the patterns better. It's not too diverse uh, like the KDE model. For KDE, it's too diverse to be useful, right? Since it's too diverse, it's just like no, uh, no, noise, okay, noisy scenarios. It's useless. But for sequence scan, so uh, it's good. So uh, by trading off the diversity of that and also the accuracy of that, the generated scenarios. So, so for these two figures, uh, give you the illustrations of the generated scenarios, but we need to formally assess the generated scenarios, right? We can assess that by some statistical um, metrics. Alternatively, we can assess these scenarios for a particular power system operation problem, right? That is, we can assess this empirically. So first let's assess the generated scenarios and uh, by the statistical metrics. So the two common metrics we use, so for, for the forecast areas, we can use the mean squared area and the energy score. So everyone should very, be very familiar with the mean squared area metric. <laughs> and uh, for the energy score, uh, uh, you can see, so we, we care about the accuracy, right, between the generated scenario and the actual observed value. And also the um, diversity in the generated scenario. 
So the more diverse, the better. The more diverse, the lower the score, the better. Okay. So as we can see, if we use the MSC metric, statistical metric, so the proposed model and achieves the best MSC for all the day in this week. And then for the energy score, so the proposed model achieves a better energy score when the uncertainty is high, okay, for these two days. But when the uncertainty is small, so it is just close to the other two uh, approaches. But ultimately, we will examine the performance of these methods based on a uh, actual based on an actual power system operation problem. So that gives you your gives the empirical uh, assessment of this. This is just some statistical metrics. So in the previous two slides, we have assessed the generated scenarios of the forecast errors of wind power generation. Sometimes such forecast errors are not available. So, but we can assess the, we can generate scenarios of the wind power generation themselves. And uh, how to assess them? For wind power generation, we are more interested in event-based measures. So we, uh, uh, so here, this is called a Briar score. So which measures the deviation of the generator scenarios from the observation with respect to capturing the predefined events. For example, in the actual observation, so we have some large ramping events. So in the ge generated scenarios, we also want to see this pattern with certain probability, right? So here, the F is a, an indicator function which indicates whether the predefined event occurs in our T in this sequence. For example, if it occurs in the actual sequence, and uh, it also occurs in, our, in most of our generated sequence, then it is good. So the entire score is um, the smaller, the better. Okay, here gives you an example. For a particular, we, we, of course, we have conducted experiments over many sites for many weeks, but this gives you uh, a particular case. Here, we can define the events. So as for example, 10% increase of wind power generation in one hour, or 20% increase of wind power generation in two hours, and so on. We can see for all the um, cases, so the proposed model achieves the best score. Alternatively, so there are also many other scores, for example, the variogram score um, to, to evaluate, to assess the generated scenarios. Here, so we, and the first term is the um, variance in the original, in the observed uh, actual data, right? And this is the um, variance, uh, variation in the generated data, generated scenarios. So the closer, the better. And uh, these case, um, based on these cases, we can see um, the proposed model always achieve the best score. Ultimately, uh, we are more interested in the empirical assessment, the empirical performance of the generated scenarios, right? So now let's consider a particular um, problem. They had stochastic scheduling problem as I have discussed before. It is a two-stage stochastic mixed integer linear programming. And uh, for each algorithm, we generate uh, 100 scenarios. We can generate 500 or 1,000, it doesn't matter. But this 100 scenarios um, is good enough to illustrate our results. And uh, we want to evaluate the expected cost. Moreover, we also, but this expected cost is evaluated based on the scenario for each scenario set generated by each, for, by each algorithm, right? We more care about the realized cost, which depends on the actual observation. Okay, we care about the realized cost. Uh, so when we make our first stage decisions based on our generated scenario set, but then this is not, this, is, this only gives you our expected cost. So we do care about the realized cost because our generated scenario set may not be reasonable. So the only way to assess whether it is reasonable or not is to assess the realized cost. Suppose we apply the actual observation. So 
based on your first stage decisions. Then we can evaluate the, we can evaluate the realized cost. Then we can know which algorithm is indeed the best. Okay. Here, let me explain this figure. So here you can see, so when we can say expected cost, which is the expected cost in the stochastic programming problem based on the generated scenario by each algorithm. And then, and they are very close, right? But this, these red bars do not mean much, okay? Because we calculated the expected cost only based on the generated scenario set. So the scenario set generated by each algorithm itself. We care more about the realized cost. That is based on the uh, generated scenario set. So we make our first, first stage decision, which include the unit commitment decisions. Then we want to use the actual observation to, do, to make our second stage decision. And then we evaluate the entire realized cost. When we assess that cost, so we can see there are some difference. For the proposed se sequence scan alg uh, algorithm, so the realized cost, no matter how large the load shedding penalty is, so it is still always close to the expected cost, which is desirable. But for the other two methods, so when the load shedding penalty is large, then the realized cost is much better than their expected cost because the realized cost reflects the actual realization while the expected cost only reflects the cost based on their own generated set. So therefore we can see a, a very large discrepancy between the expected cost and the realized cost for the other two benchmark algorithm. But for the proposed SQLGAN, so it's very stable, which means the scenario set generated by SQLGAN is the most representative. And the first stage deletions made by SQLGAN, so is the most robust ones. Okay. Next, I will introduce how we tackle the problem scenario reduction. Why do we need scenario reduction? Because we may have a large number of scenarios, so to approximate the underlying distribution, right? But they may make our original stochastic programming problem intractable. So to regain the tractability, we want to reduce the scenario, but hope, hopefully the reduced scenario set is still representative of the original scenario. This is the objective of scenario reduction. A problem statement given n scenarios. So we want to generate k scenarios. So k is much smaller than n. And for n scenarios, we assume they are with equal probabilities, but for the reduced scenario set, so we may assign different probabilities for each scenario. That is okay. And uh, this is the idea of the proposed so-called mixed autoencoder based fuzzy color string algorithm. First, uh, several deep autoencoders map time series to latent representations. <laughs> The deep hypothesis spaces in the autoencoders provide high generalization capability and capture the complex temporal dynamics. Second, those latent representations are fed into a membership and deep neural network, which outputs the degree to which each scenario belongs to each cluster. Third, based on the membership degrees, fuzzy time series clustering is employed to evaluate the centroids. So compared with hard clustering, which is our normal clustering, fuzzy clustering is better at preserving the patterns in the original scenario set, which I will explain later. So essentially, scenario reduction can be viewed as a time series clustering problem, right? But the novelty here, so usually the simplest way is to use k-means clustering, so which most of you may be familiar with. But here the novelty is uh, we first apply a mixture of autoencoders, deep autoencoders to capture the latent representations of the original scenarios. And uh, then we feed those latent representations into a membership and deep neural network, which gives you the degree to which each scenario belongs to each cluster. Finally, we also use some further clustering rather than the normal 
hard clustering so that it is better at preserving the patterns in the original scenario set. Note that in the original scenario set, there may be hundreds or thousands of scenarios. But due to computational tractability, we, only, we also want to preserve maybe 10 or 20 scenarios. So these 20 or 10 scenarios need to preserve some uh, um, abnormal patterns so in the original scenario set. So for the purpose of robustness of the resulting uh, unit commitment deletions. So that's our objective. And uh, so this is the architecture of the proposed and deep learning model. So this is the original scenario. And uh, we use K uh, and uh, suppose we want to generate K and scenarios in the reduced scenario set. So we set up K auto encoders. Again, we do not care too much about the output of the auto encoders. They are, they are just uh, some res res construction of the original uh, input. We care more about the hidden layer. Okay, the, the H1 through the latent representations H1 through HK. So they capture the most important aspects, features of the input. Okay, they are called latent representations. And then we use uh, we apply a membership deep neural network and they use the softmax activation function in the last layer to output the membership degree W, which is the degree to which uh, each sequence, each scenario belongs to cluster K. There are K clusters, okay, capital K clusters. And uh, meanwhile, these K auto encoders also output K different reconstructions of the original scenario. And based on these membership functions and the uh, reconstructions, so we can calculate, evaluate the centroids for the centroid for every cluster. So under fuzzy clustering. If it is under hard clustering, then we just take the average of them, weighted average of them. But here we use fuzzy clustering. So where we, we have a hyperparameter M that controls the level of fuzziness, the higher the fuzzier. So what is the idea of fuzzy clustering? If we just use the normal hard clustering, then the resulting scenarios will look too average, okay, too mediocre. And it will not capture some uh, abnormal pattern. So in the original set, Therefore, we apply some fuzzy clustering. So we allow, we, we want to preserve some abnormal pattern. So in the original scenario, this is the idea of fuzzy clustering. And the, later we will show, so without this fuzzy clustering, so the performance is not as good as this, the proposed one. So these are the uh, details of the architecture. So which you can refer to our uh, publications in the end of this section. So, but um, uh, due to time constraints, let me just skip this. Let's check about the numerical experiments. So here we use two different uh, data sets. So the data set from BPA and uh, another data set from ALIA, which, um, and they have similar capacity of uh, wind power. And uh, so both data sets have their head forecasts so that we not only have the actual realized wind power generation, we can also have the uh, forecast areas. Again, why do we prefer using the forecast areas? Because um, they are um, more homogeneous, okay, or less heterogeneous than the wind power generation itself. So for each data set, we fit a kernel density estimation model and then sample 2000 uh, scenarios as the original scenario set. <laughs> because otherwise, so we only have one original scenario, right, for a particular day. And, uh, but we want, we, we want to have a large original scenario set. So we use this approach. Of course, in statistics, there are many other approaches, more sophisticated approaches, for example, condition on the previous days uh, realization. 
But this, um, but our objective is to compare the different reduced scenario set and the different uh, algorithms. So the original scenario set does not matter. So we use this particular simple approach to get the original scenario set. So the task is to produce re uh, re uh, reduced scenario sets uh, with 10 scenarios or with 20 scenarios respectively. Okay. For each data set, so we will have a reduced data set with 10 scenarios and another reduced scenario set with 20 scenarios. Uh, actually, so the results are very similar. Uh, so 10 scenarios uh, already, so give you a very good approximation. And these are the benchmark algorithms. So yeah, note that the last one is almost the same as our proposed one, just uh, without further clustering. So instead, of, and the last one uses the hard clustering. But by comparison, we can show the superior performance of fuzzy clustering. So that's why so this justifies the use of fuzzy clustering okay, in the proposed model. Again, we first assess the reduced scenario set so using some statistical metrics. First is the cosine distance. Here, for example, this term measures gives you the similarity between the actual scenario and your reduced scenario, right? And the one minus that is uh, just the distance. So instead of maximize, maximizing the similarity, you want to reduce the cosine distance. Also, this metric is negatively oriented, which means the lower, the better. And uh, since the original data set, uh, scenario set has 2000 sequences, right? But the reduced one has only 10 or 20 sequences. So they will not, their distance will not too small. That means none of them will be close to zero. But still the proposed method achieves the best score, which is the lowest, okay. <laughs> On the other hand, cosine distance only measures the similarity um, between these two, right? So we may also care about the deviation difference between these two. So the Euclidean distance gives you another statistical measure. Both are important. So here I also, we, I also want to point out the, the issue with Euclidean distance because distance, this metric penalized the high impact, low probability scenario. So they want, want the reduced scenario set. So on average, uh, very close to the, uh, or the reduced scenario set is very close to the average of the original scenario set. Okay, but it penalized some extreme events, extreme scenarios. Therefore, the proposed uh, method algorithm do not just achieve the average scores, not the lowest, not the highest, but this is not an issue. So our concern is the actual performance of our reduced scenario set, right? This is just a statistical metric. So it has its um, um, usefulness, um, but it also has some issue. So that is this metric penalized some extreme scenarios. But, but this illustrates that, but what is the reason of that? As we will see later. So that's because this reduced scenario set generated by our algorithm preserves some extreme events. So that's why it does not perform very, perform the best. So according to this metric, but it will perform the best. So using our empirical test case, let's see. Before that, we can use the box plot to take a look at our generated data points. Note that although we only have 10 scenarios, but for each scenario, we have 24 elements, 24 hours. So therefore we have 240 points. So for each algorithm and uh, the first one, the blue ones are the real data points. There are 2000 data points, mm, 2000 times and 24. So we can see that, so the red one is our proposed method. So the generated scenarios or the generated points are more diverse 
are more extreme than most of the other algorithms, right? This, is, this is explains why the proposed method does not achieve the best score in the Euclidean distance, but we do not care. We care more about the empirical study. Okay, again, it's on the, it's a day ahead scheduling problem, which involves both unit commitment decisions and the realized dispatch decisions on a modified IEEE 24 bus unreliability test system. Okay, here we care about, uh, we consider two different metrics. The first is the objective error, which is the difference between the expected costs under the original scenario set and under our reduced scenario set by each algorithm. So, and this is good. This measures, uh, because we have expected costs under the original scenario set, then we can compare how close our estimation of the expected cost Okay, how close of our estimation of expected cost to the actual expected cost. But another error is also or even more important, the policy error, which measures the quality of our first stage decisions and our algorithm. That is, um, we obtain the first stage decisions under the actual scenario and the, the reduced scenario by every algorithm respectively. And then we evaluate the realized costs under the actual uh, observations, or the, okay, under the actual original scenario set, we evaluate the realized costs of these different first stage decisions under the actual original scenario set, and then calculate the difference. So, for practical use, so we care more about the policy area, as we can see. So, actually, for both metrics. These are two different metrics to measure the quality of our reduced scenario set. Okay, for both metrics, and these are normalized error, errors. For both metrics, so the proposed uh, method generate the most representative scenarios, reduced scenarios. Okay, again, the original scenario set has 2000 scenarios. And here we are required to generate only 10 scenarios based on that. And uh, the scenarios generated by the proposed method so achieves apparently the best performance in either metric. Okay. Conclusion. So stochastic programming is a natural approach to short-term power system operations and the high penetration of renewable generation. To yield high quality decisions, such as their had unit commitment decisions, we need to build high quality scenario sets that are representative of the underlying multivariate probability dis distributions. We may also need to trim down the scenario set for the trackability of the optimization problem, which possibly involves integer problem uh, variables. While scenario generation and uh, scenario reduction have been extensively studied, generalization capability and the feature engineering remain challenges. And then, so, I, so here, here are the ideas of our two different deep learning models and targeted for these two different problems. So both statistical metrics and the test cases, empirical test cases demonstrate the superior performance of the proposed deep learning approaches. So here are the uh, references and uh, our, uh, the, the related publications. So this is a joint work with my student, Jun Kai Liang. Okay, one paper for scenario reduction and the other for scenario generation. So thank you all for attending and uh, feel free to yeah, raise questions.